I've got to say good afternoon to you all. Um, uh, I want to say very little, actually, as part of this panel, because I think we've got some amazing panellists who will be able to give you an amazing amount of tips, lots of personal experience. Um, and I'm going to, with no further ado, ask my panel to introduce themselves and why they think that the topic of mental health and being open about it is so important. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, my name's uh, Simon Woollett. I'm an assistant head teacher at St. Joan of Arc Catholic School, which is um, uh, an 11 to 18 school uh, in Ritmersworth, about 1,300 students. Um, as, as, as was suggested there, I'm, I'm one of probably many, many, most people in this room who have a personal connection with, with mental health. Um, I've experienced close members of my own family uh, go through their own journeys, which has been a challenge for me. Um, but on a professional level, I'm obviously... Um, uh, I have a duty of care as a, as a senior leader in a, in a secondary school um, and I, I'm proud to say that I think the school that I work in has uh, an open, progressive attitude to, to, to mental health, um, both in terms of supporting um, students and staff, but m more importantly, I think, um, because, because of the fact that we positively promote um, positive mental well-being. Um, and I guess that the last thing I, I just want to say in, in introduction is that I've done, a, I've done some work myself with, with, the, um, with the charity Time to Change uh, in the last three years, hence my, my connection with, with Joe and the Time to Change team. Uh, I led uh, a, a, a multi-school collaboration along with Watford Palace Theatre uh, on, a, on a local level where we, where we, where we got students from across uh, three different schools to explore uh, and challenge um, mental health, uh, negative stigma around mental health um, through the arts, uh, through drama, through music, and through art. Um, what I should say is, I was formerly a drama teacher, so that was my connection there. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. Hi, I'm um, Jen Beer. I'm the health improvement lead for children and young people in Hertfordshire's public health team. Um, my role encompasses all of health, basically. And um, one of the frustrations I've had during my 10-year career in public health has been trying to convince other people that mental health is at the core of all areas of health. Um, you cannot expect people to make positive health decisions or positive life decisions if they have zero sense of self-worth, if they have low self-esteem, if they have no resilience. It's impossible to, <laughs> to make those big decisions because you don't believe you're worth making those decisions. Um, so I'm constantly campaigning, and I think there has been a real shift lately to see that actually mental health is so important. Um, you know, gone are the days really where we have a weight management program, for example, where it's just about diet and exercise. I think people are starting to see the bigger picture, and that's why I think it's really important that we're all talking more about it. And from a personal perspective, I think it's important not only that we're encouraging people to be open themselves about mental health, but that we make sure we respond to people in the right way when they do. And I think sometimes that bit of the picture is missed a little. Um, as a teenager, I was diagnosed with depression. And I think it took around three years before anyone spotted that I had depression. Um, and that's despite me openly saying to my parents, I can't cope, I can't stop crying, I can't function in the classroom. It's despite me going to my teachers and saying, I can't stop crying, I don't know what to do. Um, and it's despite me going to my GP and saying, please help me, my GP literally looked at me and said, do you think you're depressed because you've got really bad skin? <laughs> that was the response I received. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is how people respond to that when you are open is so key and so crucial. And I was very fortunate that I did eventually have a teacher who took me aside and said, I actually have been reading up about this thing called depression, and I think you might be experiencing that. And finally, I did get some help, and um, that help was enormous for me, and it changed my entire life. I then went to university to study psychology and found the best friends you could ever wish for in life who helped build up my self-esteem and my confidence again. So again, I think those things around you can make such a difference to um, how you kind of move through life in terms of your mental health. And I think we have to all play a role in that and we have to all come together to make sure that we see that it's everyone's business, mental health. 
Hi, um, my name is Roseanne Evans. I'm an author, speaker, and campaigner surrounding mental health, and I'm a Time to Change Young Champion. So I use my um, personal experience of having had a mental health problem um, to campaign against, uh, to campaign and to, to try and get people to talk openly about mental health. Only a few years ago, um, I was really not wanting to talk out about mental health because I was ashamed and I, I did certainly feel that stigma surrounding mental health. And um, becoming a Time to Change Young Champion, actually the first day, I, I'd never spoken out before. Um, and just seeing that difference in myself has made me realise how, um, how much of a difference speaking out about having a mental health problem actually can have. Um, by me speaking out, at events, I've had people come to me afterwards and say, you know, thank you for opening it up and actually I'm now going to go um, and talk to my GP, I'm going to talk to someone, someone who I trust. Um, and it's just opening those doors and make people realise that there is no shame and I think that that's why I think it's so important to talk about mental health openly. Good afternoon, I'm Jacqueline Evans, I'm actually the mum of Roseanne here. Um, I've come in my capacity this afternoon as a parent, um, as a parent who's gone through, um, sorry, who's gone through um, someone with um, a mental disorder. And, um, you know, you think, oh, this is, uh, this is an easy task to do, but it's not, it's, it's difficult. And it doesn't affect just you, it affects everybody in your family. It affects everybody in your work and everything. And um, it's so, so important to talk about it. It really is. Um, we are a talking family. And even though we are, it, it was difficult because we didn't know enough about um, mental health at all. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I didn't realise uh, Roseanne was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. And I didn't realise that that was a mental disorder. I, I just thought it was a physical thing. Um, so, you know, through my ignorance, I began to learn what it really was. And uh, that's what I'm here today to just say you must talk, you must talk to people about it. it's very important. Lovely, thank you. And I, and I think the one thing I wanted to add to that actually was, um, so I've got the most amazingly supportive structure at, at home, but it, I think it's quite important to also understand, uh, and you as um, education staff or as employers, that you also need to have that support if you're supporting and, and, and helping somebody else. And I think that that's demonstrated quite, you know, with how emotional that, that even just that was. Um, it's, it, it's hard. Um, so don't underestimate that your own needs within that too. So I wanted to just talk then, um, uh, maybe Simon, about um, uh, mental health in, in school settings. So, uh, so some would say um, uh, that the principal goal of schools is academic achievement. So why then introduce the topic of mental health and, and particularly addressing stigma and discrimination in your school? Um, well, it's interesting you say that because it, it linked to, to something I kind of noted and wrote down earlier when, when um, uh, Rifat Wall was, was talking and she said, uh, and she just referenced that, you know, whichever way schools move at the moment, they, they can't get away from the fact that they're held accountable in terms of results they're held accountable in terms of data. You know, that's what they're measured against. And they're, they're the pressures that the schools have to face, on, uh, all schools, and we've got many educationists here, haven't we, uh, have to face on a day-to-day, on a -day, week-to-week basis. And equally, uh, things change all the time in terms of policies, in terms of what schools are expected to do, and there, there's, there's those pressures added to that as well. Um, but, you know, whenever you open that classroom door, whenever you go into teach a, a lesson, and for myself, I'm a, I'm a drama teacher, and I, I, and I deal with creative, real issues. Whenever you open those doors, what's, what's there in front of you are, are real people, uh, and young people, and people who, who aren't coming at, at the lesson from, uh, from a facts, figures, and data viewpoint. They're coming at it from a, where they've just been, what's going through their mind at that moment in time, and what's impacting and affecting them. Um, 
And, and, and you as a teacher, and the teachers in here will know that you, you have to take that on board. So we have to look at the whole person. We have to, we have to work with every student on an individual level. Um, and I think the two things go hand in hand. If you have positive, um, a positive approach to, to mental well-being um, uh, within your school, um, to support the students who may be struggling, but also to, 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 to bring across an ethos where, where that positivity is shared by all, um, both in terms of staff, support staff, and students, um, then, then the two things go hand in hand, and, and, a, and a positive uh, attitude in terms of um, empowering everybody in terms of their, 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 their positive mental well-being can only support mm -hmm. academic achievement. Mm -hmm. Can I just say as well, mm -hmm perspective you know um at, at, throughout school i got quite good results um you know uh, going through school through secondary school my gcses were, were good and then when my mental health began to suffer so did my grades and i think so having having the correct support um from school to be able to not necessarily when someone's been diagnosed with a mental health problem, but before helping them throughout school to keep that positive mental health. Um, I think that's really important because it also, like you said, it, me it means that um, people can achieve their best. You know, my A-level res results weren't great, but I know I could have done better if it wasn't for the fact that my mental health problem was impacting on that. I think one, the one word that was mentioned uh, well, Sir Clive Woodward mentioned um, earlier today, and it's been repeated a number of times since, was, was resilience. Um, and if we can instill and, and build and teach resilience uh, in our young people, right from the, from the youngest age that we individually take them on, um, that is the, the skill that is best served to help them towards success. So we hear a lot, so the, the campaign, the Time to Change campaign is focusing on, on men and, and boys, um, and, and actually we, I think we're learning that there's an awful lot that we can do for um, a, a male audience because perhaps they're not talking about mental health in quite the same way as, as women and girls are. Um, Jen, maybe to you, what, why do you think it's so important, this emphasis on, on, on mental health, particularly amongst boys and, and men? I think the reason there needs to be this emphasis on boys and men's mental health. Um, and the reason we really, we really need to think more carefully about how we're engaging boys and men on the topic of mental health is that we know that traditionally the things we've done, the projects we've run, the campaigns we've run, they have resonated far more with girls and women. Um, and we know that, you know, that's clear. Um, yet, we know also that boys and men are far less likely to talk about their emotions. They're far less likely to access support. And when they do, it tends to be when they're in crisis. And they're three times more likely to take their own life. So there's something wrong there. There's something seriously wrong there. Um, in, in Hertfordshire, we've kind of, we've taken the line, we've developed this campaign called Just Talk, um, which we're really excited about, actually. The reason being that it was designed by teenage boys for teenage boys. We linked up with Time to Change um, in the early stages so that we could learn from the research and the planning that they had done. And then we took a very kind of local Hertfordshire focus and said to all these different partner agencies, to all kind of young people, parents, we need to come together and do something about this. And the culmination of that was this Just Talk campaign, which launched in January. And it has really shocked and surprised us in how much it has encouraged boys to really open up and have conversations. It's like giving them permission. But because they're giving themselves permission, because they've driven the campaign themselves, it's more powerful. Um, so I think that's been really positive. I think another thing we need to think about with, with boys and men's mental health is sometimes, I believe, <laughs> and I know some people disagree with me on this, but... Sometimes I think the way in which we conceptualize certain mental illnesses, the diagnostic tools we use even, are more in line with the female experience of that illness. So for example, the diagnostic tools for depression are slightly more in line with the way perhaps a girl or woman might exhibit symptoms than the way a boy or, or man might. And I think we need a lot more research in that area actually, to see that actually 
what might be put down in some schools as bad behaviour or naughtiness actually could be a really strong signal that there's something really wrong for this person. Um, so I think that's why there's, it's really important to focus on boys and men's mental health because we still don't quite get it right. And what do the panel think then about um, role models? I mean, you know, how, how important are male role models? How important is it that we um, see men talking out about emotions, etc.? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, um, I think it's very important because. Um, in, in my experience, um, Roseanne's uh, dad, you know, his typical bloke, doesn't talk about his feelings at all. Uh, but when we went to therapy sessions, um, you know, he was advised to sort of gently tease him out of him a little bit. And I think as a family, that helped us totally because we, we were able to accept you know, um, how, how he'd been brought up not to talk about things. Um, and he, you know, he managed, he managed to talk about things, which as a family at that time was very important to us because we could all relate to it. I think there's something really, um, really powerful about role models, about seeing someone you someone who for some reason resonates with you, that you feel some kind of kinship with, who opens up. And I think that's why we need such a range of role models as well. I think sometimes we fall upon, well, we must have celebrities. I think celebrities are really important as role models, actually, because they get people's attention um, and, you know, the people that we look up to. But also you need role models who are just everyday people, everyday people who you can relate to, talking about their experiences, and not just sharing the bad stuff as well. I think sometimes we focus too much on the negative statistics, the kind of really terrible things that have happened, and not enough on the stories of recovery and hope. To me, that's really powerful, and I think that's what our boys have told us that we've been researching with us. They want to hear more positive stories. But, but at the same time, um, young people do aspire to look up to celebrities and, and, and respond to celebrity culture and... You know, I, I think the more these conversations are had both within schools, in society and, and society at large, that the more those role models will come out. You know, it was, it was, it was fantastic to see in the summer in the middle of the, the furore surrounding the World Cup, you know, an England footballer um, talking about his, his personal battles, even at the, the kind of peak of his career with money, with fame, etc., etc., his personal battles with mental health. Um, and that, that can only be a positive to, to, you know, to, to teenagers in general, but particularly teenage boys. And we talk an awful lot about um, engaging um, young people in running projects. You've both talked about engaging young people in running projects. Roseanne, you're a very good example of, of one of our champions. But I want to, I want to just sort of think about the kind of what, what, this, what, they, what skills and, and whether that gives confidence and all of those sorts of things in relation to getting involved in something like this. And, Jen, I'd really love to hear from you about, you know, your um, experiences uh, from that point of view of, of seeing your daughter involved in something like this and what that's done also. Well, you know, Roseanne was, um, you know, oh, she, she's always been a very pleasant girl, everybody said so. And, but I've seen since her illness... Um, and everything. She, she's still a lovely person. I'm biased, uh, but <laughs> obviously. Um, but I have seen so much. Um, oh, what's the word? Uh, such a strong person come out with her, uh, come out of her, and uh, able to talk to people because she's very passionate about how she, how. Uh, this all came about, how this illness was, and how she's very passionate about how to get over that, how to help people. And uh, a lot of that is, is talking, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think from my point of view, you know, doing campaigning and that kind of thing, there's so, so much that can come out of it. I think, um, you know, a, a, a few years ago, I, I didn't 
really want to speak to anyone. I would never have imagined speaking in front of audiences, speaking on TV and that kind of thing. But actually, campaigning and doing this kind of work has given me that platform, that kind of lease of life where I feel that this is my passion and this is what I want to do. And I think it's really important. Again, it's, it's about resilience and knowing that, you know, I um, have had times where, where on my CV there's not, not much happening, but actually um, I wouldn't be afraid to speak to an employer about the fact that I had a mental health problem because I feel that it shows the skill, certain skills that I couldn't have had otherwise through recovery. So from recovering, I, you know, I've built a, a massive amount of resilience. I've had to, you have to when you're battling a mental health problem. Um, I've learned how to problem solve, which otherwise I wouldn't have learned how to do because you have to think, if, you, if you're in a situation where suddenly you're in, you're in this place and you don't know what to do, you have to think on the spot, you have to learn to problem solve. And actually, the things that I've learned in therapy are things that I can take to my job and actually use there. So, um, so yeah, I, I definitely think being more open um, about having a mental health problem in the recovery process, I think that's a great thing, to be honest. I think in many ways the, um, the skills that we try and teach um, in, in our school and I'm sure in, in, in the vast majority of schools across the country that aren't on the curriculum, um, that, you know, the things Roseanne mentioned, um, resilience particularly, but empathy, um, uh, communication, uh, teamwork and adaptability potentially, which was mentioned earlier on, you know, they're the same skills that, that we've, we've talked about in the sessions this morning that, you know, are, are key to th those soft skills that, that employers want as well. Um, and so I, I think there's a real overlap um, here. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's about keeping it on the agenda, keeping the conversation positive, keeping that, 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 that focus um, as positive as we can and keeping those skills pushed right forward. So I also want to think then about um, two things, really. Um, it'd be, it would be nice to think about, um, and I guess Jen and Simon, about how you, what you've done within a school setting to look after staff and ensure their well-being. And I guess also tips for all of us in terms of maybe three things that we do to keep ourselves mentally healthy, to look after our mental health in the same way as we might go off and, and, and jog or eat well or not drink loads of alcohol for our physical health. So what kinds of things have, have you done within school settings to support staff? Um, I, was, um, I was talking to a lovely lady earlier. Um, and for me, I think something that's really important is staff, school staff in particular, but lots of professionals, really struggle to have that time to reflect. So they're kind of, they have so much time and so many things that they need to achieve in a limited amount of time that actually all the other things they're being asked to do, the promoting mental health, all of these things, it's hard to have time to reflect on how can you interweave that into what you're already doing. So I think it's allowing, senior leadership teams allowing staff enough time, and I know that's a lot easier said than done, but allowing enough time for people to actually have that opportunity to reflect. And something we find really useful in Hertfordshire is we have pastoral leads networks, um, one in every single district, and it gives an opportunity for professionals who have children's kind of mental health as their primary concern to come together and support each other. So it's sharing best practice and it's learning, but it's also actually saying, I don't know how to handle this situation. And hearing from other people who are in a similar situation, but a different school perhaps, saying, we feel the same. We don't know what to do. And it's that kind of shared learning, I think, can be a huge support for people. And also having that dedicated time each term to kind of come away and really think about what the key priorities are. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, my school's in Hertfordshire, and we're part of the, the, one of the pastoral leads networks, and, and it is a fantastic uh, forum for, for sharing best practice, but also for, you know, just talking things through where there are concerns, there are issues, and it, seeking support from your colleagues beyond your own schools as well. Within our school, um, I, 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 I'm, you know, we, we have certainly had to, we have, we've, we've felt there's been an increase in, 
in staff needing support in the last few years, um, and I mentioned support staff as well as teachers uh, in that, um, and, and equally staff having to uh, be the frontline people, I suppose, in terms of in supporting students who are experiencing mental health difficulties. And, the, and we've become very aware of the strain, the pressures that that puts on staff. Um, so we have somehow found the, the, the finance and the money to, uh, to bring in some, some, some regular supervision uh, into school for, for our teachers. And, and the, the, the sessions are bookable. We have the same uh, therapist who comes in on, a, I think, a monthly basis. Um, and and the, the sessions are booked out. Um, staff staff use it, um, and it's it's been really positive in terms of just allowing people the chance uh, to talk things through um, uh, in, in, a, in a trusted forum and, and 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 talk things out, which I think is is crucial because the pressures are high. Great, and just in the, the sort of final minute or so that we've got left, I don't know, Jackie um, and Roseanne, um, top tips looking after yourself. What would you be your top recommendations? I mean, I think really it's, you know, everyone is different and everyone has their own thing that they would do. Um, for me, it is actually doing things like this, being proactive and actually doing something that I really am passionate about and that I really enjoy. But also um, simple things such as um, I love my rabbits and I will just go <laughs> in an evening, go into the shed and, and you know, um, They've, they've heard me laugh, cry at them, and they never react, you know, in any... So it's great. Um, so, yeah, just... just That's what I do. <laughs> and, and mine is, I just go and dance. So, oh, I come that. on, Strictly, here I come. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we've run out of time now, but I think I'm going to hand back over now to, um, to Tim, because you're going to be doing, I guess, facilitation of questions from the floor, if that's... If that's okay. So thank you very much, very much. Please round of applause for the panel. <laughs> Uh, um, sorry, Mum, I, I can't call you by your first name. It doesn't work in a Jamaican family. I have to call you Mum, yes? But essentially, Mum, the, 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 someone bet me that I would do the Theresa May dance. So when you mentioned that, it just brought back that flushings of seeing Theresa May jigging <laughs> robotic style on the stage. It's never going to happen, by the way, whoever bet me to do that. It wasn't going to happen. I won't pick Abba anyway, but that's another question. So any questions for this, this, this amazing panel in terms of some of the things that we should be thinking around, around having the conversation about... Uh, mental health, or what we can do in our schools, or even something that you've seen that's worked in your school environments that's worked that you want to volunteer and share. Please, this, the, the forum is now yours. Say again? Oh, where? Ah, oh, young Jermaine has to hear. Come on, Green, come on, Green, you can do this. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, you want Jasmine, you let him win. <laughs> Okay, uh, by the nature of the audience here, we've talked a lot about teenagers and secondary education, but um, I'm chair of a number of schools, one of which is a primary in a very deprived area of North London. And one of the things I'm passionate about is making sure we have the funding there for mental health services for both the students and for their parents. Mm. And we use a service which you may have come across called Place to Be, mm. which allows parents to come in if they're having difficulties, uh, as well as somewhere for the children to talk. And I just wonder what the panel's thoughts were about pushing for funding for mental health across the board in education, as my primary does have children with a lot of issues, but I'm aware from working in other primaries that um, all schools will have some children who have issues, and the sooner you pick it up, the sooner they can uh, learn um, how to move forward and so it won't impinge upon their futures. I mean, I think um, the thing is, you know, I don't feel like there's ever a young enough age that we can start to start educating children about mental health. And I think it is realising there's a difference between mental health and mental illness because we all have mental health. And so I think being able to, um, to, to teach children whether it, it you know, be five or ten minutes in the mor morning, I, I saw a, a news article um, earlier this week about children learning meditation, and I thought that was a great thing just to help them, and they were all saying, it relaxes me, and these were primary school children. So I think the earlier the better, you know, def definitely. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. I think 
I think, there's, I think it's also, sometimes we think quite traditionally when we think about mental health support and we think about counselling services, which are really important, but I think there's also so many other things that, that we can be doing, as, as kind of Roseanne's alluded to, you know, the, the things like the daily mile, promoting physical activity, building mm. those habits really young, because mm. they're huge coping strategies. And definitely meditation and mindfulness, we've got lots of primary schools that have been bringing that in for staff as well as pupils. So it kind of relates back to what we were talking about before. And they can be so powerful. Mm. But I do still think there remains a gap in terms of kind of that therapeutic support for, for younger children. I think that's something... Again, collectively, we all have to push for more to get more funding for. I think, um, as well, uh, parents are, are asking for this now, as well, at a, a primary level, too. It's, when I leave here today, I've got to hot foot it back to Rickmansworth because we've got our school open evening this evening. And it just, just maybe think, actually, because, you know, in the last couple of years, on that evening, we've certainly had questions from parents of Year 5 students, Year 6 students, you know, about how do we look to support mental health in our school? Now, five, ten years ago, the culture was different. I'm not saying the problems weren't there and the, the concerns weren't there, um, but those questions weren't being asked at that, at that time, and certainly it's something that we are being asked by parents now. Um, and so I think, the, you know, the earlier it can come in and that support and that, that teaching of children and the good habits, the better. I'm just going to agree with everyone. <laughs> I'd say I think, it's I think it's a bit of a shame that we aren't starting at primary yeah. um, with all of this stuff. Yep. The earlier the better. Any additional questions, points, insights they want to share? Okay. None. Please put your hands together and thank our... Oh, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Jasmine. Question? Of course you can. Um, You've got so, the microphone. <laughs> um, as a student, I'm just doing my second year of A-levels, and I find there's a lot of workload. I'm sure as teachers, you're also aware of quite how much we're put under now. And a lot of students and a lot of my friends do struggle with mental health illnesses and stuff like that. And I was wondering, is there any kind of promotion in schools and teachers as well that for those of us who really, really struggle with mindfulness and just sitting, is there any kind of adver um, advertisement on types of things like sports or activities that can help with this, because the sports I do, they really promote like good mental health. Um, but for other people, they're like, what do you mean you go and do sports to calm down? How does that help you? So is there any kind of promotion in schools to kind of promote how physical well-being can tie in with mental well-being? I think we, um, well, I know we, 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 you know, we, we do speak to the students about, about engaging in those, those social activities, um, Particularly the arts. I mean, I'm an arts teacher, but uh, you know, drama, music, sports, PE, um, and, and we draw the links. Um, particularly when the students join us in, in year seven uh, through our PSHEE lessons, uh, we draw those links between you know positive mental well-being and engaging in those activities, both from a from an outlet perspective and, and a social perspective as well. Um, in terms of uh, other kind of campaigns and marketing campaigns. I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure I can answer that question, but there may be people out here who are able to, to answer the question. As a gentleman here with his hand up might, might know something. <laughs> uh, the, the importance of having um, an effective co-curricular um, kind of program is, is, is really valuable to the boys. In our, in our state school, we're a state grammar. Um, and we have some really effective mindfulness going on in the school, which we start at year eight. Uh, and this, this is all down to kind of good nature and, and, and a, you know, extra time commitments from teachers. Mm. But what we find is really effective is having an effective uh, co-curricular where the boys feel that they belong to something. And, and really it's finding that value, whether it's, whether it's those boys who, who are part of a sport, but if it's, if it's not for them, it's a sport, it's finding you know, what does make them feel like they're part of their own community. Um, and we find that, um, you know, we've worked hard for a long time at it, uh, but by having something that they feel some belonging to, that starts to open up doors. Whether, and, and so many people touched on it today, just levels of communication and all the positivity that we're trying to, to kind of, uh, to inbuild into our ethos um, and into the positive behaviors of the boys can kind of permeate naturally mm -hmm. through having people that they look up to um, mm -hmm. Like that. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think there's huge, huge, huge benefit to, to, to mindfulness. Uh, we use the uh, Mindfulness in Schools project um, mm -hmm. to teach dot B to our boys. 
and, and, and it's, it's brilliant in so many ways. But I think it's actually there's so much that can be done, which is student-led as well, just by facilitating um, the th things I've said, really. Mm. Fantastic. And hopefully you'll share that in the app. Not that I'm plugging anything, but it would be great to understand exactly what some of the things that you're finding affected, because there may be somebody in the room who is looking for something in addition to that. I think that's... Oh, um, yes. to engage young people in sport to support their mental health. So it's a pilot project at the moment. I'm sure that Sport England are intending to share their findings once the project is over um, come next May. So hopefully you will find that schools do share those kinds of activities. Okay. I think it's definitely important you know, to, to have sport, especially um, I, 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 I'm a squash player at uni and I think those are the people with whom I have a real connection and we can kind of talk about anything when we're on the squash court. It's just kind of a place where we're able to talk about things. And um, nature as well, I find is really helpful, you know, going for a walk. It's somehow, it's, you're no longer enclosed in four walls and you're suddenly able, um, I find anyway, I'm able to just talk about things that I would never ever talk about in just a room sat next to someone having a cup of coffee. Um, just the idea, and I think it's partly you're not looking at them directly, so you, you're able to just walk along, you know, and um, yeah, so I think things like that are a definite uh, thing that I think people should think about. Fantastic. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our amazing panel. Thank you.